Starship will hopefully be the vehicle that enables Mars colonization. But when the time comes, what will the colonists bring in order to set up a fully functioning colony on Mars? Should they land at a mid-latitude site or closer to the equator? What power source should they bring? How will they mine for water and what will their oxygen source be? All that and more in today's video. The first step for any colony is to obtain water. Anyone hoping to start a colony on Mars needs to make sure of at least one thing, that it's located next to an extensive water source. That's because you can use water for not only drinking and irrigating your crops, but using hydrolysis, which effectively means placing an electric current through your water, you can split it into its constituent atoms, hydrogen and oxygen. These are rocket propellants of themselves, and since Starship uses methane, the hydrogen can then be reacted with CO2, which luckily for us comprises the Martian atmosphere, into methane and oxygen, which can then power your return journey. This of course is why Starship can take so much payload to the Martian surface. It doesn't have to worry about bringing its own fuel with it. But this comes with some risk of course. If your colonists can't set up in situ resource utilization quick enough, then they risk missing their return synod. Remember, these transfer windows happen only once every two years. So any Mars colony is going to need fast and easy access to water. Now, lucky for us, there is tons of water on Mars. Large portions of the planet have ice just under the surface, exposed by recent impact craters that have provided evidence for that fact. And while you could theoretically just mine it with an excavator or a shovel, I prefer to use our astronauts' time not on manual labor but on actually doing the science that we sent them there for. My favorite solution to the problem of mining water on Mars is to drop a nuclear reactor a la kilopower into a mine and use the heat that any nuclear reactor produces to melt out the water which can then be pumped up and used however the colony needs it. Now this isn't only attractive because it cuts out the power intensive middle step of large excavating equipment and astronauts, but it also opens up the possibility of methane clathrates. These are ices with methane trapped in them that can be up to 13% methane by weight. Now, as I said earlier, the plan to produce methane is to first hydrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then use the Sabatier process to turn that hydrogen into methane by reacting it with CO2. This is extremely energy intensive, and if we can find a natural source of methane on Mars, it would significantly simplify the task of creating propellant. This is why clath rates are so important, and if we can land near a site rich in them, it would change the game when it comes to Mars. Finding a large deposit of clath rates could enable hundreds or even thousands of Starship launches just when a colony needs them, but it's important to note that we actually haven't discovered large deposits of clath rates on Mars. They're just a fairly likely solution to the issue of outgassing on Mars. Now this is exactly why SpaceX is going to want to send some science starships to ensure that they're going to be landing at the ideal location for starting a human colony on Mars. Now that we've accounted for methane, let's talk about oxygen. While you can make it through hydrolysis, that's really energy intensive, and I'd like to see a bioreactor of sorts using algae or other high oxygen producing plants to create oxygen from Martian CO2. Now this would give your oxygen system the added benefit of creating food for your colonists or for animals you might want to bring along with you, like fish, which could have an important role to play in any aquaponics system the colonists want to use. I think we'll see a bifurcation of any oxygen producing system, with ISRU propellants largely using electrolysis to produce their oxygen, while the colony uses biological means. Now that we've accounted for how we're going to get water, methane, and oxygen from the Martian environment, we still haven't accounted for how we're actually going to power those processes. And that's the crux of the issue I want to dive into right now. You largely have two options when on Mars. You can use solar power or nuclear power. Wind and geothermal power aren't likely to be used. We're a couple billion years too early for any hydropower, and the discovery of any fossil fuels on Mars would ignite significant scientific controversy. So solar and nuclear it is. Let's start with solar. The tops of Mars's atmosphere get roughly 59% the solar radiation that Earth does. But it's important to note that when you get down to the surface, there are multiple other factors that affect the efficiency of your solar panels. Number one, Earth has much more weather than Mars. 
with cloudy days offering significantly more variables to adopting solar power. It's also important to note that the higher up in latitude you get, the more variable your access to sunlight will be thanks to seasonal variations. This is why any SpaceX colonies will likely be under 50 degrees latitude and even more likely under 40 degrees latitude. Because during winters, not only are the days shorter, but the sun is also lower on the horizon, meaning even less sunlight gets through. And of course, another factor that can't be discounted are planetary dust storms on Mars, which can reduce light levels by up to 70% for weeks on end. This would put a significant strain on solar power collecting resources, and the batteries that you need to store the solar power for nights or dust storms. And while a planetary dust storm would likely put some strain on the colony's power resources, since most of the power is likely going to be going towards ISRU or mining, you could scale back on those functions and only keep what's necessary for the colony online. This is why having biological recyclers is so important in case the power goes out, they provide a little bit of cushion for you to understand the problem and then fix it. Solar panels are also significantly cheaper and the fact that Elon Musk is investing into both battery technology and solar power through SolarCity means that Elon is likely ready for an all-solar Martian infrastructure. But I do think there is a place for nuclear reactors on Mars. Sure, there's going to be lots of red tape, but I do think Mars is going to be more of a public-private partnership than just Elon Musk going all Daniel Boone on us. And nuclear power is one of the ways the US government could really show its contribution to the Martian project. Solar could likely fully power a Martian colony, but as it scales up, the power requirements are going to become more and more absurd. And permanent habitation above 50 degrees north is likely going to be impossible without some form of nuclear power. And also, in case of emergency, the colony is going to need several backup power sources, and this could be provided in the form of a kilopower reactor. It's being developed for the Artemis Moon program and could have tons of benefits for the Martian program. It's initially a 1 kilowatt reactor, but it can be scaled up to 10 kilowatts or even up to 1 megawatt without significantly changing its design. And it should be noted that the US is no stranger to sending nuclear material to Mars. We've sent plutonium-239 as a part of the RTG, or radioisotope thermal generator, as a part of the Perseverance and Curiosity rovers. Kilopower has the distinct advantage of using uranium as its fuel instead of plutonium. This means a much cheaper cost as it's much more widely available, and the uranium can also be low enriched and low-enriched uranium is highly advantageous to both the US government and anyone who wants to use it, since it can be used to make nuclear bombs and has much less paperwork surrounding it. It also has a higher chance of the government authorizing its use. Now, using low-enriched uranium does come at a cost to performance, with a 1 kilowatt version being over 200% heavier than its highly enriched counterpart. Yet, you have to realize that this is only a couple thousand pounds, and with Starship payloads massing in the hundreds of tons, it's much less of an issue than if this was a legacy launch vehicle. And this disadvantage for low-enriched uranium decreases as the power of the reactor increases. A 10 kilowatt version of kilopower would suffer only a 70% mass penalty when using low-enriched uranium, and if you scale up the design even further, this disadvantage decreases even more. This is because low-enriched uranium has something called criticality problems. It has a much harder time sustaining a nuclear reaction simply because there's more room between the uranium atoms, there's much more other material in there. But as the reactor gets bigger, that becomes less and less of an issue. I personally think it would be well worth the cost of bringing at least one kilopower along with the colonists, not only to just provide emergency power, but also to serve as a test bed for nuclear operations on Mars. Because as you scale up from a small colony to what Elon says is going to be a city on Mars with a million people, nuclear becomes more and more attractive. And it would be perfect to have that knowledge to draw upon when designing a fully sized nuclear reactor on Mars. Another alternative to solar and nuclear in case of emergencies could be fuel cells. If you have a methane oxygen fuel cell or generator, then you can use the propellant you've been storing up for possibly years in order to power the colony in case of emergencies. This would be highly inefficient though. 
Think about all the energy you've spent trying to get that pure CO2 and oxygen only to just turn it all back. So this would likely be used only in case of true emergencies, but again, redundancy is going to be the name of the game on Mars. When you're 9 months and millions of kilometers away from anyone else, it's better to err on the side of caution, of course. And of course, if you rely on your fuel cells too much, you could actually miss your transfer window, since you'd be using your own fuel to keep the lights on. That's another reason why I think it might be worth it to send at least one kilopower out there. Mars is going to be an unforgiving place, and colonists need to be ready for that. By choosing the proper landing site and making smart technical decisions, we can ensure that we land on Mars to stay. And in my next video, I want to do exactly that. I want to look at the different landing sites SpaceX and NASA have selected for possible human missions and go through their advantages and disadvantages for both science opportunities and habitability. With that, I'm Cost Plus Content, signing off.